colleagues. Uh, yeah. I want to welcome you to the sixth lecture of the webinar series organized by the Social Policy Analysis and Research Center, Faculty of Arts, University of Colombo, to commemorate uh, its 15th anniversary. Uh, first, uh, I would like to speak a few uh, words about the center and its act activities. Uh, mm -hmm. The Social Policy Analysis and Research Center is affiliated to the Faculty of Arts, University of Colombo. Uh, it functions as one of the focal points within the Sri Lankan university system that explores critical areas of social and economic development. Activities of SPARC are centered on research, training, advocacy, and networking. Uh, from its inception, SPARC has worked in diverse fields of study, such as social integration of youth, community-based poverty monitoring, and disaster resilience. The center facilitates close collaboration between academics and institutions outside the university systems, including governmental, non-governmental, and private agencies. The involvement of uh, SPARC uh, uh, team in both international and uh, local research projects have benefited local academia, research staff, policy and decision makers, students, and the general public via various methods, such as training programs, intervention programs, policy documents and recommendations, workshops, internet, international and local conferences, reports, and the need assessments. I would now like to take this opportunity to briefly introduce our speaker for this, today's session. Professor Dr. Sabine Troger is a human geographer with a strong linkages to sociology and anthropology. She was first trained in the field of didactics of geography and composed her PhD thesis on the topic. The image of Africa with German high school students and its meaning for teaching geography at German schools. This was in 1993. Her second thesis was based on food crisis research on the Ufia Plateau, Tanzania, titled Food Security in the Context of Societal Transformation, Local Actors and Their Agents in Tanzania. Professor Troger has lived in and with life uh, context and livelihoods in Africa for about uh, 20 years. Uh, she has worked as a consultant for GDZ and the, and the German Ministry of Economic Development and Cooperation in several countries of Southern and Eastern Africa and Latin Afri uh, America, Ecuador. She held her professorship at the Geography Institute at Bonn University, of University, Bonn University from 2002 until 2020 and is now Professor Emerita, still based at the same institute at Bonn University. She has published more than 80 mostly peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and has given many international lectures in Great Britain, India, Mexico, the USA, and several capitals in Africa. We are extremely glad to have Professor Troger as our speaker today. Prior to starting the session, I kindly request all participants to abide by the following set of guidelines to ensure minimum disturbances during the session. Kindly keep your mics muted until the end of the session. Any questions can be raised during the question and answer session after the lecture. Participants can either ask the question verbally or send them, uh, uh, send them as a message. We look forward to your cooperation in this regard while thanking Professor Toga for her time and for sharing her knowledge with us. I would also like to thank everyone joining us today. I hope that this session will be fruitful and beneficial to all participants. Thank you, Professor Toga, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Nishara. Thank you for introducing me. And I think I should just start with the presentation now. Um, the presentation is called Everything that is happening now is beyond our capacity pastoralist societies in the course of social transformation. Sir. Actually, the first part of this uh, title yes. is a quote yes. from, from these people I worked with. Ah, I will, I will you, I mean. Is it okay with the, with the noise? Yes, 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 yes. And the thing I'm actually really interested in is, oh, no, it does not work. Sorry, Nisha, I think I have a problem with the with managing now the the presentation because I tried to uh, with it and it did not. No, yeah, 
Yes, yes, yes. Yes, now, now it is working okay. I have yeah, to do it yeah. in another way. So yeah, what okay. I'm really interested in now is this aspect of social transformation. And first of all, I want to stress that in general, it is seen as a very positive thing. So already in 2012, you found the, uh, the, the statement by GIZ. GIZ is the biggest development agent in Germany. And it's working here in Sri Lanka as well in many um, projects and places. So they said, transformation is a large scale adoption of truly new measures as central paradigm of international cooperation. And likewise positive, it was noted by the IPCC that is a worldwide panel for climate change and they said transformations in economic, social, technological and political decisions and actions can enable climate resilient pathways. And a last example of this very positive view was a conference in Bonn, that is where I had the professorship and I'm still living in Bonn. And Bonn is the former capital of Germany before the two Germanys united and Berlin became the capital. And in 2015, we had a big conference on Bonn Conference for Global Transformation. What I would like to stress is that actually, I think it is a buzzword. And not by far not that positive as it is stressed here. Let me start with some other quotes. One is by Schools, 2016. Transformations to sustainability require a shift beyond scarcity discourses towards a politicized understanding of recourses and sustainability. This means that you have to consider this question of power and dominance in societies and only then you can have a positive, if you consider this, this politicized view, you can consider the meaning of this social transformation. Sorry, these are two already, but I will go by one by one. I myself wrote in, a, in, in the most recent publication, thus, if transformation is to be achieved in an empowering and proper way, then a truly politicized view will exp which exposes and resists the ongoing production of harmful power relations is inevitable. And in consequence, sustainability transformations cannot be considered a success unless social justice is a central concern. And this is a topic altogether of my presentation. I first want to introduce this group we will move to now to you. It's a group of pastoralists in the southern lowlands of Ethiopia. As Dr. Tanishara said, I have lived in uh, Africa many years. And these are examples and some results of my research I did there. There you see the quote again. And we are looking now at the situation of the pastoralists I want to present to you. First of all, where are they? You see a map of Africa here and of Ethiopia. And then in the square, you see the area where this group of pastoralists lives. As I said, they are one group of pastoralists. There are uh, altogether 16 in this area, in the lowlands of Ethiopia. And they are considered to be world cultural heritage. So they have a special meaning for historians, for society altogether. As I said, they live in the low, Southern Lowlands. And this is an area which is by far, and that means by more than 75%, dominated by livestock keeping, in this case, they don't have camels, they only have cattle, goats and sheep. All these pastoralists living in this area. Now my argument of the whole presentation is now that I want to have a look at the dynamics of social transformation
from the go global to the national and then the local level. So I want to have a look at these dynamics and in the center of these dynamics, always the agents, the people themselves stand. I will start now with the perspective of climate change, which is a global phenomenon with tremendous regional and local impacts. As you know, from the case of Sri Lanka, you have a lot of problems with climate change. So I do not tell you anything new here. My approach all together in, in my, my scientific work is actor oriented. So what I am interested in is what people um, themselves, how they perceive the situation and how they react on it, which strategy of agency they choose. Now let's have a look at this climate change perspectives and dynamics in this area. At uh, the time of 2011 to 2014, I did some research on climate change altogether in Ethiopia. And in 2011, I was there with eight of my students from Bonn University and they worked together with um, development workers in Ethiopia. They taught them the methodology and then they worked together and they assessed the situation of climate change all over the country. The results, just to give you an overview, first of all, are there is a Western and the Eastern part of climate change impacts in Ethiopia. The uh, Western part is the highland of Ethiopia. As you have here in Sri Lanka, the, the wet zone and the dry zone. And here you have the hilly area and the lowlands. With relation to the hilly area, to the highlands, the, for, uh, the, the um, climate change uh, was characterized by irregularities in the rainy, uh, rainy seasons. They had more hail than they had had before. Hail is a typical feature of the highlands in Ethiopia, but they had a lot of the hail now. They had a lot of wind and extreme rainfall. The lowlands, on the other hand, and that is the area we will now have a look at, were uh, characterized by these features. They had a short shortage of failure of uh, bulk rains, that is one type of rainy season, a delay of rain and irregularities of current rains, that is another type of rainy season, which uh, would, would, uh, would start now somehow, sorry. And there was an increase of temperature. Now, just to give you an idea of how I work, I mainly use the participatory approach and the instruments and my students as well did that. Just this as a short remark. And now I will go to this uh, group. Um, I, which is in the center of my presentation now, the Nianga Tom. This is one of these pastoralist groups, and this is characterized like the other pastoralists in this area as well, by living in the lowlands, in this case, 360 meters above sea level. Before, they used to have something like 400 millimeters of rainfall per year, and today nobody knows. And the production system is mainly livestock. As I said, the, uh, more than 75% of their income is based on livestock. They migrate with uh, their livestock and a pastoralist system. I don't know whether you are aware of this. These are herders where the core family, that is the woman and uh, the elderly people and the children, they stay back. They stay in the settlement. And the men, when they are older than their sons, they, they will move with the cattle during uh, the dry season because then the pastures are not good enough anymore and the cattle must feed on, in some other areas. Additionally, they have some income and especially some food from agriculture. They are agro-pastoralists. Um, they do rain-fed agriculture, which of course gets a problem when you have the climate change. 
and they do or did do the river retreat agriculture. That means the uh, agriculture on the river banks of the biggest river going through this area. It's the uh, the name is Omo River, and it is fed with water from the highlands in Ethiopia. And when there is rainy season in the highlands, the uh, river Omo will uh, go across the river banks, make them moist, and as well deliver some, some silk material because there is a high erosion in the highlands of Ethiopia. So a nice material comes down to the river banks of river Omo. That was in former times. I will come back to this later on. And there is another uh, aspect which is important as well. These pastoralists, they move around always with Kalashnikovs. So you will not ever, ever meet a pastoralist without a gun. And they fight other pastoralists from other uh, ethnic groups, try to capture their uh, animals. And as well, of course, they try to de defend themselves against the attacks of the other pastoralists. So the pastoralists are always with guns, which is important later on. Now, the society we are looking at was characterized by three pillars. The first pillar is the age group system. This means that the males, only the males are important in the society, um, are defined and characterized by uh, five altogether five age groups, the children, the young people, the middle aged men, and then the so called elephants and the last group is um, a group of well there are very old men and there are something like uh, saints and and um, priests. The age group of the elephant is the most important age group, they are the political group. And they are the ones to tell the people what to do. And telling means that they have very strict norms and social control. And the age group of uh, the fourth age group, the elephants, will tell the people what to do. Altogether, the whole society is defined by um, what we then call culture of sharing. So what they used to do is share that what they gained with, be it milk produced from the cattle or be it some, some uh, grains from their agriculture or be it some meat from slaughtering goats. Normal, normally in the traditional way, uh, cattle were not slaughtered. Um, but these were the things they shared among each other. Now let's have a look at the situation of the climate change. As I said, we worked together with, or we worked with uh, but the uh, participatory approach and the instruments, and we were interested in what the people themselves perceived and what they knew about climate change. And this is the result of their ideas of it. They said that something like 1998, after 19, uh, 1998, the rains fail, failed. Well, sometimes they might have rain in rainy season once a week, and altogether the rains were very unreliable. That is what they said and what how they perceived the situation. The estimation of the time we did by by some certain discussions about what happened then and what happened then, and then we could somehow define that must have been these years. The situation of the climate change continues. There is no change anymore. And now these are maps of the year 2019. There the situation in May was already very stressed. So they did not have any produce from the rain fed agriculture because there was no rain. And in a little bit later in June until September 2019, the situation showed up as a crisis. The same is, by the way, true for today. I took the same internet uh, resource. And again, you see that this area is characterized by crisis. And this is from July this year until, and that is of course a, a idea for the future until September, 2021. So what could the people do? In former times, they used to, walk with the um, cattle to the east. They still do this, 
but as there are many cattle and as uh, the pastures are very bad and not uh, fertile anymore. Of course, that is not enough space for them to uh, migrate with their cattle. They can walk to the south, but there, and now the uh, Kalashnikovs become important. There is another pastoralist group coming from Kenya and going into Ethiopia, Kenya in the south of Ethiopia. And um, uh, so they are afraid of these Turkana, that is the name of this pastoralist group, very many pastoralists there are, and again, that is now the border to Sudan, they can move there, they can move um, to the west, but again the Turkana are there and there is no water, so the only thing they can do is they try to get into Omo National Park, but as it is an Omo in a national park, of course, you will have scouts fighting them off. And there is another pastoralist group coming from the north as well, trying to use the pastures in the national park. And what they told us, and that was very important, when they go for migration nowadays, they will migrate for um, two to three years. They do not return to their mothers, to their wives, because uh, the pastures are so bad. So they stay away for a long time. And especially the young men then said, they were a bit ashamed of this, but they said they sell some cattle because uh, they don't have any money. They need to buy some grains. And as they, their family is not around, their mother cannot give them any food. So they have to sell some cattle in order to raise some money. But they hide this information from the elderly ones, from the elephants, because they are not allowed to do this. Now, that is what the people told us. This woman, she said, um, us women, we cannot exchange butter and other produce anymore, as the cows and goats have no milk. Thus, we have no women friends anymore and get more and more dependent on our men or husbands. This is the opinion of the woman. And this old one, a nice picture, I think, of uh, one of the elephants. He said, nature is not giving any signals anymore. How can we know? Our calendar is not working anymore. That means they cannot, by nature, see what will happen when, they, when the younger ones should walk with the animals, should migrate with the animals. They cannot see this anymore. And the young ones, they told us, why should we listen to them? They don't know. So the calendar of the year does not work anymore because of climate change. And now, at that time already, the livelihoods were strongly put into question. The inner social hierarchy of power was put in question. They, as I said, the young ones did not believe in what the old ones told them anymore. And then, of course, the social customs and norms were not really in control anymore. At least there was a question whether they were still in control and perspectives of the future of the society were highly questioned as well. So the whole, the whole society was disarranged. That was already during this time of climate change. And now I will move on to the next level and that is the national level. Here I link this question to what happened starting from the year 2011. And that is they built up a big sugar production uh, in this area, which is irrigated. And I come back to this later on. Um, again, of course, I'm interested in what the people told us, how they perceive the situation. The whole thing started with the late Prime Minister Melesenawi of Ethiopia. He died some two years later when, after he had been in uh, the southern lowland and gave the speech. And he said, in the coming five years, there will be a very big irrigation project and related agricultural development in this zone. I promise you that even though this area is known as backward in terms of civilization, it will become an example of rapid development. So people were considered to be uncivilized. They were what the, uh, what the Highlanders said. They were not using 
their land properly and therefore they wanted to establish this sugar uh, production there. By the way, it is highly financed by, what do you guess? Yes, you are right, the Chinese. That is the typical thing which you have here in Sri Lanka as well, I think, and you find it in Africa likewise. Now, this is the sugar plantation. You can see from starting from the year 2014 to 2015, 2016, 2017 and 2018, this cultivation area for the sugar has expanded every year. So it became larger and larger, which meant for the people that especially those areas along the river Omo were deforested and the sugar was planted there. Therefore, the people, as you can imagine, could not use this area anymore for their river retreat agriculture and, and altogether their rain-fed agriculture anymore. And I will show you in a minute, they could not water their animals anymore in a good way because all this area was taken by the sugar plantation. Here you see the size of the sugar plantation. These green um, uh, sort of packages there, this is the area which um, the sugar corporation, Kuras is the name, used for growing the sugar. And you can see that, of course, they put their sugar plantation along the river Omo because they needed the river Omo for irrigation. And what they did as well was they uh, took quite big parts of the two national parks, which are as well in this area, the Omo National Park and the Mago National Park. They were not interested in questions of their sustainability or protecting the nature anymore. They were just after their sugar, which they wanted to place. And of course, due to this build up of all this plantation, of course, they needed to build streets, which you see here on the pictures uh, that you cannot see much is because we could not see much either because there was a lot of dust in the air. But you can see that they built these, uh, these streets, of course, on the one hand, to uh, to transport the sugar when they had harvested it, and of course, as well to transport the migrant workers, I will show you in a minute. Here, this is now the picture of one of the sugar factories. At that time, when I took the picture, they were just building the factory. In the meantime, they have five factories in this area working for production of, of the sugar. Um, and you see in the front, you see several houses, these are the houses for the migrant workers. There are about 30,000 migrant workers from the highlands in Ethiopia in this area. The pastoralists themselves, they hardly find any, any job in the sugar production because the highlanders are of the opinion that these pastoralists, they are uncivilized and they do not know anything about agriculture and therefore they prefer to employ these people coming from the highlands. Of course, there are quarrels with the people. They try to resist these new powers and they start to, to fight with, with uh, the police as well. And here in the blue shirts, you see policemen trying to calm them down. And they are everywhere all the time. When I was in the field, I everywhere met somehow policemen. And sometimes you will meet the military as well. Now, but land grabbing, which we saw now is does as well mean water grabbing. You can see here this this area of the of the sugar plantation, which is called Kuras, and this relates to a big hydro dam. The construction of which was already planned in the 80s of last century, but the construction was started in 2008 and the filling was completed in 2016. Since then, you cannot think about the river retreat agriculture anymore at all, because there is no river flow as it used to be coming from the highlands, bringing the water of the rainy season. But of course it is stopped at the, at the uh, river wall. And so 
this river retreat agriculture, which was one source of income for the people at that time, is not happening anymore. They have no chance to do this anymore. And as I said, the rain fed agriculture is not possible because of the climate change. Here is one other example of the meaning of this water grabbing. This is one of the canals alongside the river Omu. There are something on both sides, they have these canals to transport the water for irrigation additional to, to the river. So they use this for, for irrigation. They are 15 meters broad. And the negative side of it is this, what we see here in the picture, it is a so-called underfly. This is an area where the pastoralists have to beat their animals through during daytime. In there, of course, it is dark and the animals are afraid and they have to beat them through so that they can go to River Omo for watering. So every day they have to, to walk through this underfly here with their animals. Now another aspect of on the national level, and that is what we call decentralization. I'm not sure whether it has such an impact in, uh, in Asia, but it certainly has a very big impact in, um, in Africa. And it comes together with so-called committees. Again, I'm interested, of course, in the reaction of the people, and you will see some quotes from them. These committees are built up um, everywhere in Africa. You can, when you Google them, you will find many places. Here, this is are the committees of community-based natural resource management. Then there are committees of the integrated wildlife conservation. There are committees by the Climate Land Interaction Project, and there are, uh, is a committee, or there are committees alongside with the so-called rangeland enclosure management, which actually is the example I want to show to you. And this is meant to be a good means of climate change adaptation. But I'll show you what is happening. What was the idea? Actually, I was one of those ones who had this idea, I must admit, at that time when I was uh, employed by the uh, German embassy on uh, in a climate, um, climate change project, and I got the money from them. And then there was this idea, what do you do when you have these pastures, which are eaten down all the time by the animals? So the idea was to enclose the range and define places where the animals may go and define please places where the pasture can recover. But as you can imagine, this has a lot of meaning to the people because in order to enclose the range, you have to build fences. And the fence, of course, has an inside and an outside. And all of a sudden, you had processes of inclusion of the, those ones who had the power in the society to use this pasture land and the others were excluded. So all of a sudden, the question of private ownership came up, which disturbed the whole society because these fences, they were acting like structural forces. Together with this question of decentralization, you will find this idea of participation, which first of all sounds nice. We have this democratic ideals of participation, so you will have a situation where you try to make people participate in order to that the local actors and the resource players become more active in the role of management of their resources, which first of all sounds nice. So these committees were then built with young men, older men, women, younger women, older women, and so on, which to our perception as well, I, as I come from Germany, of course, democracy is something which is well appreciated. But in this case, it had another meaning. I will show you in a minute. So this process of decentralization came about in the shape of a committee. And what this, does this now mean to the people? 
Let's listen to three of them, three representatives. An old one, a woman, and a younger herder. The old one, he says, as you can imagine, these people of the community cannot be respected because he belongs to the group of the elephants, of course. Would you listen to those unexperienced youngsters? The woman says, oh, excuse me, as far as the decision is in the hands of the committee, I don't think it will bring a change. Rather murmuring and disobedience to the new ideas. So the people will not listen to this committee, she says, because they are used to other rules, to other ways of express power and so on. So they will not listen to what was happening there. And the young one, he says, the leaders from the district and the people from the government made us discuss the question of punishment. And that was a new idea that people who trespassed into these gated areas, into these fenced areas, they were to be punished. And he says, so the discussions were led by the experts and they were the ones to give this a speech on the positive side of the new punishment system. Those ones who told them to build up this punish system, punishment system actually came from Addis Abeba, the capital of, um, uh, of Ethiopia. So they were the ones to tell the people, ah, you should punish those ones who trespass into these um, uh, areas behind the fence. This is this aspect of decentralization. And now my last perspective, and I think then I'm somehow good in time. Um, there was this question, which justice can be done to the people? What could justice mean? The justice we I, I showed you in these quotes in the beginning, and I will come back to this again. So what was the idea? There was the idea of climate services, value chain development, but as well, there was this idea coming as well from, from the government that the people should move into villages and should become sedentary and not walk around as pastoralists anymore. I just ask you, what shall they live on then? What is their resource of income for their livelihood if there are no pastoralists anymore? But that is my side remark. Now, again, the reaction of the people and I would, would like to stress one point. There was this idea of having a value chain development in terms of climate services. And the idea was that the cattle should be fed, at least partly fed, by the residues of the sugar production. Molasse is this um, residue which is processed when you uh, press the uh, the sugar cane in order to, to uh, get the sugar out, then there is some sort of meshy substance left and the cattle, they like to eat this because it is sweet. So they, they somehow like to eat it. And then bagasse, that is another residue of the sugar cane. And these are the sticks of the sugar cane, which are cut off so not the whole plant of the sugar cane is used for processing the sugar, but pieces are cut off. And this, of course, the cattle could eat as well. That was the idea. I was involved in this project as well, but unfortunately it did not materialize. The sugar cup company was so much against this idea. And of course there was another idea and that was who should govern this process of giving these molasse and bagasse to the people. They were people to inner inside the society to get hold of this dominance of uh, within these villages. And they were the ones to, to then organize this distribution of, of, this, um, of these residues of the sugar. So, in a way, people were afraid that new structures of power would be built up and therefore they simply left this thing. And now I come back to what I said in the beginning. These are the three quotes with relation to justice, 
Transformations to sustainability require a shift beyond scarcity towards the scarcity discourses towards a politicized understanding of resources and sustainability. Thus, if transformation is to be achieved in an empowering and poor, poor way, then a truly politicized view, which exposes and resists the ongoing reproduction of harmful power relations is inevitable. And in consequence, sustainability transformation can only be uh, cannot be considered a success until jo social justice is a central concern. Now, what to do with these quotes? As I have shown you, we are confronted with a society which, which has a lot of interest groups, power hierarchy, dominance of people, and there are patterns of inclusion and exclusion stabilized by taboos. So urgent attention must be paid to this structure, to these communities. As I said, we were interested in what the people themselves uh, acted, what, what their strategies of action were. And of course, then you are facing such a community which has so many different groups and, and interest groups and so on. So what can happen? And this is now a new idea, by the way, for those students among you. It's a very, it's a very interesting discussion which is taking place right now. So I'm sort of in the front of, of these discussion at, uh, discussions at the moment, or I'm part of this front. And there's a question how to conceptualize justice. What has to be done in order to realize justice? There's a drawing which you cannot read. I know this, but I will uh, enlarge it. This is the idea of Bennett. I quoted him and his co-authors uh, just before. And this is I, the idea of what, what could justice mean. And now in a, bigger, in a bigger shape so that you can read it, he differentiates between three parts of justice. The one is the recognitional justice, which is the basis of all justice. And it means that uh, pre-existing governance arrangements as well as distinguished rights um, knowledge, needs, livelihoods, histories and cultures of different groups in decision have to be acknowledged and respected. The second aspect of this uh, justice is distributional justice, which means defined as fairness in the distribution of um, benefits and harms of decisions and actions to different groups in space and time. And the last aspect of, of these just transformations is procedural justice, which means this is the level of participation and inclusiveness of decision making and the quality of governance processes. So these are the ideas connected to this aspect of justice. And now if we look at what happened with this community, then we must say that there was no respect for inner social arrangements. They, they did not care. The government did not care. The people from Addis Abeba did not care. There was no fairness in distribution of benefits. So nobody cared about them. Who, who would gather, uh, gain what? For example, this uh, aspect of value chain development of the residues of, of, um, of the sugar production how could this be safeguarded that the merits of this were distributed in a fair and just way? And of course, there was no participation and inclusiveness of decision making. And therefore, I tell you, and that was my whole presentation on that social, social transformation, as I have shown it to you, is just a buzzword. And now I have finished. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Sabina, uh, for very uh, comprehensive and uh, in-depth, uh, uh, I would say, like uh, ideas and also uh, your uh, presentation uh, uh, based on uh, uh, what you have gathered uh, by engaging in a very in-depth uh, fieldwork.
work uh, on uh, uh, in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, so uh, uh, now let me uh, uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, uh, if you have any questions or comments, you know you can just uh, uh, just uh, introduce yourself and uh, briefly introduce yourself and. Shah, I cannot hear you anymore. Ishara? Um. Now I see you. I could not hear you, Ishara. Ishara, yeah, I... are you understanding me? I can't see Ishara. Ah, Siri. Yes, I, yeah. I cannot see him either. Yeah, uh, he joined. He, he's, he has joined. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, we, we have uh, 14 minutes. I think, uh, we, I mean, we can open the floor for questions and uh, comments. Yes. Yes. Can I, uh, can I come in? Yes, yes, sir. yes. Yeah, thank you very much for that very enlightening, uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, I think we need, uh, you know, uh, another session one day, you know, in the future, <laughs> to really discuss, you know, all the implications of your presentation, particularly in the light of uh, what's happening in different parts of the world, uh, in different ways, but uh, naturally conforming to the same kind of pattern, especially the role of uh, private uh, capital coming from outside and also the role of uh, the national, uh, you know, governments and, and also various right. other stakeholders. So yes. anyway, I don't want to therefore get into any uh, kind of discussion on, on your presentation, but I think it's really uh, very, very detailed, uh, you know, analysis. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, we should certainly uh, uh, take this uh, kind of discussion forward in the, in the future, in the, in the near future. <laughs> and I, I want to just mention that uh, some of you who are participating uh, from Spark and various other places, uh, you know, Nishara, myself, and uh, Sabina, you know, have been having discussions uh, to really um, have a long-term um, arrangement for Sabina to be part of a Spark. And uh, so we have done a bit of work already, three of us, uh, and hopefully uh, we will have a kind of a long-term uh, arrangement so that uh, you know we will be able to pursue this line of uh, inquiry uh, and also research and then of course uh, uh, discussion. Uh, well, with that, uh, let me stop. Uh, you know, I, I I want to thank you, uh, Sabina, for that very uh, very uh, uh, you know thought provoking and you know very insightful uh, presentation, and I'm I'm quite sure it will uh, provide a very important reference point for us to uh, discuss our own situation in Sri Lanka, which of course is different, but also similar yeah. in, in many ways. So I think, <laughs> I think we can certainly discuss and I think the, the whole context in Ethiopia, I have been to Ethiopia a couple of times and uh, I have seen with my own, own eyes the uh, situation. So, I mean, we can, we can discuss, but I think, you know, we have a very different situation in Sri Lanka. And of course, having similar challenges and issues. Uh, so naturally, this can be a very comparative kind of a perspective for Sri Lankans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I can see a lot of parallels as well, but I did not want to go into these. But it's certainly, it is very interesting. So any questions? Any questions? Uh Um, uh, Professor Sabina, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I cannot yeah, see you, but um, I can hear you. Yeah, um, uh, so thank you so much for the uh, thought-provoking presentation. Uh, my question is on, it seems that, uh, that you have explored uh, a very sensitive uh, 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 way of life in relation to climate change and also uh, certain pressures coming from, um, uh, uh, coming from uh, the 
the developed countries. So um, my question is on now, there, are, see, there have to be a, a model or a solution to cope with uh, the issues that they experience. So as a researcher who have been there, what do you, what do you think that would be the most uh, plausible and practical solution to the issues that these uh, pastoral communities are experiencing? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, you are getting me now on the wrong foot because actually I do not really see a solution as such. The problem is really very severe and we tried to solve somehow the problem by this Bagasse and Molasse, by this value chain development, because I mean, the sugar plantation is there. You cannot say, I don't want it. And then you, you just kick it off. So it's a fact. And what can be done? You, you are completely right. And I cannot give you a proper answer to this. I can just see what happened to the people and I'm in close contact still with some of the people um, as well, contact with, with students from Ethiopia, from the Nyangatom in Germany. But I'm really helpless. I must really tell you, and I cannot give you any, any good answer on this. I do not really see what can be done. I mean, the, the problem is the whole, the whole society will be somehow as a society of pastoralists, it is on the, on the way of being destroyed. Of course, there will be some people who can survive, who can make something out of it, no doubt. These friends I have who are in Germany, they are studying in Germany, one is writing a PhD, they somehow managed. But for the majority of the people, I do not see any solution. I'm, I'm really sorry for this. I wish I could answer it in another way. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. What would you would you be your suggestion? What which idea would you have in in, in a situation like this? Well, uh, to be honest, Professor, what crossed my mind was the uh, solutions or the actions taken in uh, Australia with the Aborigines, because the I know that uh, comparatively they are different. Uh, however. Uh, Aboriginals do live uh, some sort of a life where they have retained their values and the lifestyle. Uh, but of course, it could be costly and there will be uh, so many other legal and financial and even diplomatic things um, that we have to, that, that should be sorted out if such an approach is taken. But that's what, my, that's what crossed my mind, actually, when I, when I asked, uh, asked the question. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. The problem in Ethiopia at least is, and I don't know about the situation in Australia that much, um, the people in the highlands, and this is the majority of the people, they are considering these pastoralists uncivilized, uh, not worth mentioning and so on. And this has still gone on. Of course, there are exceptions, as I said, and I myself, I try to promote those ones who are in Germany a lot. I do really a lot for them just to, to give them a chance. But in general, the people are considered to be stupid, uncivilized, everything. So nobody really cares. And then I don't know whether you are aware of this. There is a war at the moment developing in, in Ethiopia a war between the uh, um, northern um, Tigran uh, people and the others, and they are really fighting. So at the moment, there's a deterior deterioration of the whole situation in Ethiopia altogether. So nobody will care about these pastoralists then anymore. It's sad, but it is like this. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Can I, uh, uh, I, I think people are quiet, so can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, now, you see, uh, there are two things. One is, you know, climate change that has been going on and that did not, uh, I mean, that, that happened, uh, that happened over a longer period of time. Uh, I remember like in the eighties and so on. And then, then you have this uh, new, uh, kind of modernization, you know, drive, you know, with the sugar sugar plantation and sugar 
factory and then people from you know islands being uh, shifted to work on these uh, sugar plantations and factories i'm just wondering uh, i mean like uh, if if this uh, sugar plantation and sugar factory uh, i mean if this did not happen of course it had a huge impact and it it really made the situation worse uh, when climate change was happening and certainly it would have had an impact you know it would have had an impact on these people irrespective of whether there is a whether there is a new intervention or not uh, but but the point is that that the situation has been aggravated because i mean climate change is a global uh, process uh, where you know whether you contribute to contribute to it or not you are affected because it's a global process i'm just wondering uh, you know whether you could really disentangle these two uh for instance if if there was no i mean like we always have to use hypothesis that there was no intervention like uh, the sugar plantation and sugar factory and and the movement of people from elsewhere to this area but i'm just wondering uh if the climate change situation alone uh continued uh during this period Uh, what would have been the <laughs> what i mean this, this may be too much to ask but anyway i'm just uh, i'm just speculating because i see two two major two major variables you know really coming into the equation uh, we know one is the climate change which has been going on which is a gradual process which naturally has an impact whether you like it or not and then you have this new intervention uh, so i'm just wondering trying to put these three things together Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't have to respond. You can. We can discuss it later. But uh, mm-hmm. but I just wanted to really uh, you know uh, you know uh, see how the two can be connected. Yeah. Well, Professor Zire, I think there is not a real connection possible. I, I mean, these are things which have happened, and you cannot turn back the wheel. Yeah. So yeah. it is difficult to guess what. happened if the sugar plantation had come into this area because it's there and um i wonder whether i mean maybe if the people had been left alone with their climate change then they would have developed some ideas of how to protect themselves maybe they, they would have had some some lakes or so with the water from from the uh, rains in in the highlands to to build up some structures in order to have some irrigation as well and so on i i have no idea and as the situation is as it is it's difficult to to guess what else could have been done i mean here in sri lanka you have we both discussed about this already this question of migration a lot uh so there are many people migrating i think i have read each eighth person has a migra- migratory background because of climate change here in sri lanka so i think something like this would not be a solution i don't know whether it's really a solution to the people in sri lanka but in in ethiopia i think for these people who are not well educated like there's what few ones i know who are going to universities but the others they have no no proper education there is no effort which had been done before for the people um so i i really have no idea what what could be a solution to this okay it's a pity so because it would be nicer if we if somebody could come and say this and that has to be done and then it is a good solution it would have, would be good but as i'm afraid that we cannot do this yeah uh so uh, i think uh, with that uh, uh i think now it's four uh, so we can uh, close our uh, session uh, uh before that uh, i would like to uh, uh say thank you uh, again uh, to professor toga for accepting our invitation and uh, conducting uh, this uh, throat provoking uh, presentation to us uh, and uh, as uh, sir said uh, so we have been uh, uh, discussing uh, uh, to develop some uh, you know 
uh, uh, proposals together and uh, to uh, uh, like jointly uh, implement uh, these uh, proposals uh, in the future through Spark. Uh, so uh, uh, with that, uh, I think I uh, would like to uh, uh, say uh, uh, even the thank you for all our uh, uh, all those participated for this uh, 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 our discussion and uh, so this is our sixth uh, discussion and we are planning to have the seventh one uh, in September, 3rd of September I will share the, the flyer with you all uh, so I uh, last, last not but least uh, I think I have to uh, also say a very big thank you for Spark, uh, uh, Palit, uh, Belinda, all our uh, Spark group uh, for organizing this uh, uh, to just to commemorate our 15, uh, 15 years of service. Uh, and uh, because now this time our service here. Uh, so, I mean, he's the one who already started Spark and we have been uh, actually uh, since then, uh, I think this was officially uh, started in 2006 and since then we have been uh, I mean uh, working uh, we have been engaging in different uh, research projects different activities or in different courses uh, through Spark uh, so uh, I think uh, thank you very much sir so uh, for that also because uh, you're always helping us and also giving a lot of advice uh, for us to further develop this and uh, again once again Professor Troger uh, thank you very much. So with that, I uh, uh, just uh, say thank you and uh, goodbye uh, to you all. Yes, goodbye. Thank you very much, Dr. Nishara. Thank you. Thank I, you the much. last thing I would like to keep is those ones, students also who watched, they shall keep these two terms in mind, social transformation and justice. That would be something I think is really very important and this will will be as well important here in Sri Lanka. So this is my message. Please excuse me, but I wanted to add this. And now, thank you very much. I was very happy that I could